It's nice to see you too, though. I'll wait for some more people to show up before I go into details about what we're doing. Basically, Sin is, uh, Sin is feeling sick at the moment. came here. I hear I am here, hello. So there we go. Right. Thank you full screen. I can't see chat. Excellent. Let's put Ted back on. Hey, okay, good. We got some more people. Excellent. Yeah, there's no way of announcing this because uh, Sin is not feeling well. Which means that uh, I can't tweet out this is happening. She's like sick in bed. Hello, Michelle? Mikael? Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. So we're doing this at a different time. This is like 12 hours difference to the last one we did, so hopefully... Uh, different people catch it this time.
<laughs> well, it's like, because at the end of this, we'll just go back in time and make sure none of it happened. It's, it's like Derasane. Okay, people have shown up now, so I think we'll start by going over what we're doing. Hello, SW Frost. Okay, so here's what we're going to do today. Uh, this is time manip. Yes, it is time manipulation. So let's talk about how this works. So Bloodborne's got these four distinct times of day that you play through when you start the game. Um, it starts technically in late afternoon. After you enter Odin Chapel, it switches from late afternoon to evening. And I might just turn myself up a little bit because I'm not very loud. That's better. Okay. Hello, Michelle Crimson Angel. Okay, so I'll start again. So Bloodborne's got these four distinct times of day. When you start the game, it is technically the late afternoon. When you enter Erden Chapel and the cutscene plays, if you're going and going inside, it switches from late afternoon to evening. When you view Lawrence's memory through the skull, it changes from evening to night. And when you see Queen Yana appear at Moonside Lake, it changes from night to red moon. So. Um, in a standard game cycle, that's always happening in the same order because of the way the world's designed. So you have to go through Central Yarnum to Erden Chapel, which means you have to go from late afternoon to evening. You have to view Lawrence's memory in order to get the password to get into Forbidden Woods. So you have to go from evening to night. And then you have to, um, in order to... Oh, so I got that. Yeah, basically, in order to get out of yeah, in order to get out of Central Yarnum, you have to go through Erden Chapel. So that switches it always from late afternoon to evening. Um, in order to get to Lawrence's memory, it has to go from evening to night. And then, in order to get to through Forbidden Woods uh, to Moonside Lake, you have to have seen Lawrence's memory. So it has to go from night to red moon. So, but you'll notice that the whole of Yarnum and Bloodborne's world, everything's interconnected. And we could technically visit those locations in a different order if it weren't for three very specific locked doors. So the first one's the one from Central Yarnum to Erden Chapel, uh, which we get after Gascoin. Second one is the one that goes from Cathedral Ward to Forbidden Woods, which is after Amelia. And then there's one that leads back. Kyan's here, hello. I haven't seen you for ages. Hi, Ava. Okay, everyone's showing up, good. Um, so, and then you have this other one that goes back the sort of one that loops back from Bidden Woods to Central Yana. So if we could bypass any of those three doors, we could view those cutscenes in a different order, and that would change the time of day in a non-linear way. Now, it turns out that we actually can bypass the Forbidden Woods to Central Yana during Yosefka's Clinic. If we do that, we go directly from Yosefka's Clinic all the way to Shadows of Yarnum, and we skip the whole of Central Yarnum and the whole of Cathedral Ward. And there's also the advantage of when the Red Moon cutscene plays, it doesn't just change the time of day like the other cutscenes do, it actually teleports us into the middle of Cathedral Ward when it happens. So not only do we change the time of day out of order, but we actually skip entirely the event in Erden Chapel that would switch the time of day. So there's two ways we can skip that Forbidden Woods door. Uh, the first one, and the one that everyone sort of, I think, remembers when you... You can softlock the game doing this. Yes, we have to be sure we don't do it. So the, the, um, the one everyone kind of remembers, because it was doable when the game first came out quite easily, is there's a fence by Yosefka's clinic, and if you just run at it from a specific angle and jump, you go over the fence. And when you go over the fence, you end up behind the locked door, so you can go directly down to Forbidden Woods from there. Now, what happens is they actually patched that out in, um, I, it's like somewhere before Old Hunters, they patched it out. But if you have the old, like, release of Bloodborne, like you have a disc from 2015 and you put the disc in, you can actually just install and ignore the patches. So that way you will have like a 1.0 save file um, with you able to do that glitch. The second is the Werewolf Grab, which, um, yeah, SLB Frost mentioned that in the chat. So basically that Scourge Beast in sort of foyer of the clinic 
if you can get it to do its grab attack on you at a specific part of the hallway, um, it's kind of like in the corner, I think, by the door. When it grabs on you and pushes you, you just you can, if you time it right, like slide through the wall and you pop out the other side. So you bypass the gate that way. Um, basically because I already had a save file from 1.0 with the gate open, we're just doing that. So the gate's already done. Um, and yeah, the, the Scourge Beast thing, it's something that's done by speedrunners now, but I'm just saying like, we already have the top one done, so we don't need to worry about this. It's just two ways of doing it. So um, here's some examples of what's possible if we do this. I'm going to try to show off as much of these as we can. So we can fight Gascoigne during the Red Moon or during the nighttime. We can explore the second half of Yahagul before the Blood Moon. So we can see like that, that area where the cramped caskets are and the Bell Maidens. We can see that in the night and in the evening. We can go to Upper Cathedral Ward before the Red Moon. Uh, Weirdly, we can see the Forbidden Woods door open from behind. You can see the little skeleton man sitting in the chair and the door opening like that behind him. Um, and we can do some cool stuff, like we can fight Amelia and Eileen at the same time, and we can fight Amelia and the Bloody Crow at the same time. So that's the end of our little introduction here. And um, people who weren't here last time maybe don't know why we're doing it now. This is the Community Return to Yarnum event. It happens every year from the 24th of March to the 7th of April. And uh, we always take this opportunity to promote uh, Bloodborne-Wiki, which is the site that's run by Meth, and it's contributed to by Meth and also other people, um, such as myself, such as like the Tomb Prospectors, uh, people like that who've written quite in-depth guides to various parts of the game, done a lot of research, and Meth runs that site entirely herself. It's not hosted on Fandom, it's not hosted on Faxtra. She has to run that by herself. She's paying for the hosting costs. She's doing all the code herself. She's made that whole website basically from scratch. So uh, because basically it costs money for her to do that, it also costs a lot of time for her to do that. If anyone just wants to go to um, coffee.com slash Mephistophea, like I've got down the bottom, and kick her like five bucks or ten bucks, that really, really helps. Our last stream we did, we got about 200 bucks, which is covered quite a lot. But if anyone wants to keep chipping in, that'd be really great. So let's just close you down. Now I have to switch over to the actual game, which means the thing will go weird. Are you still weird? There we go. Now I have to find my buttons again. Okay. Put you back up. There we go. And now I just need to get the chat back. And it's here. Excellent. Okay, so hopefully everything is still working. And let's put background back. There we go. Oh, ground of alignment. Back up. And I'll move from up here. It's a little bit smaller. Okay. Alrighty, let's go. Oh, actually, I'll just put some sound on. Mm -hmm. Let's actually just choose this. There we go, that's better. Okay. Just making sure you can all hear it. Uh, there's OBS, and there's the chat. Okay, cool. Uh, could someone in the chat say something so I know the chat's not broken? Because it had no one said anything since I switched monitors and it sometimes messes up. Okay, hey, okay, we're working. Okay, so. Um, you'll notice if you're paying attention when I loaded the file, this character is... They level 205. Thank you for saying something. They're 205. They have 39,000... No, 395,979 blood echoes. But the only places open are the clinic and the sick room. The, the, um, yeah, the sick room and central Yarnum. So 
the reason that it's like this is because this is my glitch character. Now, like I was saying, what I did here is I grabbed this character on 1.0 and I did the glitch on 1.0 and then after doing the glitch, I patched the game back up to 1.09. So this is still playable. You notice I'm still online and everything, but the clinic gate is open. You can do this yourself if you have a copy of 1.0, but um, keep in mind that if you do do that, the file you make, like you basically have to wipe all of your files to do this, so if anything ever goes wrong with this file, I basically have to like sacrifice all of my other files to get it back. And this is also the file that I use to test stuff for Bloodborne Wiki on, because I can basically just go wherever I want really, really quickly, because I am strong enough to basically like not die to anything. Um, just make a beeline for where I want to go, so you'll notice that the gate is open. Game is a little loud. Okay, good. I actually can't hear the game. I'll turn it down a little bit. There we go. Hopefully that's better. I feel like we all kind of know the soundtrack of Bloodborne by heart at this point, so it's not really necessary. Um, so you can see that this is open. Now usually you can't open this till so you've um, entered the nighttime phase, but we are still during the day. The only other lamp we have open is the one outside Gilbert. So let's go. Oh, actually no, let's show, let's show off something first. Let's show off something first. Ever wondered what it looks like if you go to the Yusefka's clinic before you enter Central Yarnum? Let's go up here. We can actually pop around here and it's Yusefka. This is real Yusefka, not fake Yusefka. And if we talk to her, open the door, and then Are you out on the then I'm And she'll actually say like she can't open the door. I cannot I am that is a real Yusefka. And you can see we, we're walking directly through her. So like the actual Yusefka NPC is just this sort of invisible like zone that exists here. And this graphic is here basically in case you can kind of squint and see through the door to make sure there's somebody there. But, like, that's not really there. Like, we can just... We can... She acts like we're hitting her, but you'll notice the weapons just pass through her. And... Through here. It's a material. This always, like, this is a material error with the game. You'll notice this quite a bit in some areas of the game where, like, um... There's the material, which is like the 3D sort of like the way it's receiving the light is is off on some objects. So there's like this glowing suitcase that's really like more obvious at this time of day than at other times. We can go explore here. You can see there's no celestials here, but if we go all the way to the back. The transform celestial's still here. And you might be wondering what happened to the other Yosefka. We go through here. can actually see her. And there she is. So we can actually, she's got no AI, but unlike the, the real one, we can hit her. So we can actually, aggro. we can hypothetically hit her. There we go. So she takes damage. And you'll notice like she doesn't As far, as far as I can tell, uh, what she's doing is she's trying to get back on here. She's got like a home zone and she's trying to kind of get to her home, which is like, yes, here. And like we could, if we wanted to, we could kill her here. She's got quite a lot of hit points and because uh, she's not hostile, we can't visceral her. And 
All she'll do is just continuously walk back to this spot. And I think there's a point in killing her now if there's really no... We don't really get... I think she might drop Urban Writhe. Um, but... Eh, whatever. The thing about the NPCs in Bloodborne is, like, if there's more than one instance of an NPC, um, each instance is actually a separate character. Oh, thank you, Foster. Uh, time? Time is not ruined yet, but we're on the way to do it. We are going to cause so many time paradoxes, it's ridiculous. And this is, a, this is quite a tedious process, by the way. So we're going to be seeing this a lot because we're basically going to have to play through the whole game several times. Uh, with, like, an unupgraded... I think my weapon's unupgraded, I can't remember. Uh, it's plus, plus six, okay, yeah. So the reason that... that it, oh, here, Nostalgic Dishback. So the reason that my weapon is plus six is that I went down into the caves here uh, when the first time I went through the fence. And um, I'm trying to think of what order I want to do this in. Okay, well, we'll do Eileen later on. I was thinking about should we do Eileen, let's not. Um, I went into these caves to begin with. And I killed the giants, because the giants have a very low chance of dropping the twin bloodstone shards. So I just killed a ton of giants and got my weapon to plus six. So Eileen's quest is is um, triggered by you seeing the Forbidden Woods title card, basically. So the second that we see the Forbidden Woods title card, Eileen is kind of out of the game, because we haven't met her yet, so it'll just sort of erase her. But, um, what we'll do is the next time we do this, I'll make sure I trigger Eileen to start with. And then when we go back, like, we'll be able to fight Eileen and, and Amelia at the same time, which is kind of a cool thing to witness. So we have no blood gems, which is kind of shitty. We also don't have the blood gem item anyway, like, we couldn't, um, add to the... We couldn't add to the um, the weapon, so we're just stuck with like a plus six weapon. It's like on its basic thing. We're gonna have to fight Shadows of Yarn, which can be quite tedious, but uh, we'll try our best. Oh yeah, I actually did. I kind of did this a couple of years—not a couple of years ago. It was like three or four years ago. Um, I remember when Sin Sin was in the woods. Uh, with her boyfriend's family, so we couldn't stream together, so I did this. Uh, with Xenolalia, who people- Okay, people might know Xenolalia because we did an Armored Core reaction stream together, and then YouTube took it offline because it, it had copyrighted footage in it. So, if you saw that live, great. If you didn't see it live, you'll never see it again. Should I risk it? I think we'll tag the lamp just to be safe, because otherwise, if I die at Shadows of Yarn, I won't have to run all the way back from the clinic. Oh, hang on, another thing. Um... Oh yeah, you know, well, yeah, yeah, that, that, that stream's gone because, okay, this is what happened. Um, we were streaming it and then I was talking about like other mech shows that influenced Armored Core and I started showing clips and a bunch of those clips, like, actually all those clips, all of those clips were literally on YouTube because I thought, well, if I show a clip that's on YouTube, um, it's not going to matter. Obviously, if it's on YouTube, by definition, it's safe to show on YouTube, but then we got pulled midstream with a thing saying, you're not allowed to show that. And I'm like, it's on YouTube already. What is wrong with you? Anyway. Hmm. 
There's gonna be a lot of long pauses because I've got no one to talk to. And this is just like it's forbidden woods. You've all seen it hundreds of times. Oh yeah, the develop. Yeah, the thing about the developer chalices is like, um, those. The way that the chalices work is like someone has to have the chalice on their like, um, on their save file, for it to work. So like, I would like to do developer chalices again, but they're mostly not available anymore, because they were like on files that don't exist. So I'd have to get someone with it, like Trin or someone, to remake the chalice. And then, like, use the new glyph. Um, but, like, if you want, like, the, the hacked chalices that have the gems in them are still available mostly. I was using them the other day. Very, very sadly, the uh, Bloodborne Wiki actually has a no damage guide. Um, and it was written by me. And as you can see, I cannot no damage anything for shit. Um, the only bosses I've ever no damaged are Bloodstaff, Beast, and Lady Maria. And that is entirely because I wasn't trying to. I was just like, fuck it, I want this fight to be over. Um, I wrote it based on someone's, someone's no damage guide video that they made. I basically just wrote out the video. The, the funnest way to do this is if you can get a Shaman Bone Blade before the fight. You can get them to fight each other, but we don't have any. It's gonna be a no fun stream, I'm sorry. Remember um, Lance was showing this off once? Oh hey Zeno! We were just talking about you. About our uh, Armored Core stream that got us in trouble. You, you were actually here last time I did this um, time zone thing, like, oh, like three or four years ago. Anyway. Come on, just die before the... Good. You had a debate about Bloodborne running at 120 FPS. Oh no, 30 FPS. Eh. It's locked to 30 FPS as far as I understand it. I know that's why um, uh, Lance was having trouble. Lance was having trouble, like, porting things between Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3 because Bloodborne's, like, locked to 30 FPS or, like, a proprietary thing, whereas um, Dark Souls 3 can go 60. But like a bunch of the things in Bloodborne are like stuck at 30 FPS, and if you run it at a uh, faster frame rate, it just like breaks. I mean, you've seen the like PS1 games I play that are like 12 FPS, and that was fine. I don't know if I'll be able to beat Ron. Uh, without, like, refreshing first. This stupid icon going following me. There's Yuri. I think Damien just, like, clears a path for me. 
I know like Dark Souls 2 had a specific issue where um, the frame rate um, was tied to the weapon durability. So when the game was running at um, 60 FPS, weapons degraded twice as quickly. That thing, by the way, they're speaking of like frames and stuff. I am convinced that is specifically set up to be a joke because they know that you'll get um, iframes when you open the chest. They put it there and it's timed exactly so as the chest is opening, the Garden of Eyes jumps on you. Anyway, Damien's dead, but hopefully. Don't want to get invaded while I'm doing this. Okay, let's see if. Yuri is still around. Oh, Can I get Yuri to follow me in? Maybe not. Okay. I don't know if we'll actually be able to beat Rom with 12 vials because she can hit very hard. Yeah, I should be able to. Okay. If anyone's interested in like what Bergenworth used to look like and stuff, Altair and I talked about that the last time we did this. We are going to have to kill Rom twice at least to do this. So. We kind of have enough vitality to take hits now. When, um, when I played Elden Ring, if anyone was watching me stream it blind, I was like, Estelle is like a cross between Rom and Amygdala, but I somehow don't hate it. Oh my god. Well, if anyone's curious about this, right, you'll notice that we jumped, like, all the way down and we survived, and that, that didn't. And what happens is, as you're falling, um, you get this, like, special invulnerable, like, bespoke invulnerability effect that affects you and nothing else to let you survive the fall. Um, which means also that, like, you can use that, for instance, if you, if you exactly know the timing. If you're about to frenzy and you jump down... The frenzy won't affect you because you have this invulnerability thing running. But it doesn't affect anyone else, so if you can like knock uh, like the Garden of Eyes or Yuri down, they just die. Anyway, here we go. Hello. So have to be really careful here because if the um, amygdala grabs us, we'll end up in the 
we'll end up in the Nightmare Frontier, and we won't be able to get back. Like, we'll softlock the game. Okay, so be very careful that this doesn't touch us. So I just want to grab the Yahagol lamp to make sure we don't get... Because if we, if we ever end up out of here, like, we can't get back. So what we'll do is... Now, I am actually going to play through this because um, I'll explain as we go. But basically, if you revert time, it turns off the ability to get to the second half of your huggle. Because the elevator that you usually use won't run. So we're going to have to go kill one reborn. And then we've killed one reborn and we've got a lamp in the second half. We can revert time. And we'll also be able to see what it's like fighting gas coin under the red moon, which you usually don't get to see. Um, let's just rip it. Do I have any gems? Oh, no, I don't, because I don't have the gas coin thing, of course. Yeah, so after this, we'll, we'll just go back to Erden Chapel. And we'll reset the time. Luckily, your hunger's pretty short. You don't have shortcuts. A lot of people don't actually know that you can just jump off the stairs there and just skip all of this. Uh, we okay. We'll grab the upper cathedral ward key because I may as well show what that looks like in um in the evening. Uh, it's not very interesting, but it's it's not interesting, it's just kind of weird the way it, it looks. You'll see. Oh yeah, the beast claws being a hidden, essentially hidden weapon, yeah. You can probably tank the amygdala's laser thing, but we'll see. So even if we have this uh, tagged, if we reset the time of day, the doors will still be locked, so like we won't really be able to see very much of your huggle. So we actually want to kill one reborn and get the lamp behind it. We've gone okay so far, but One Reborn is one of those bosses that, like, if things go not great, um, it can kind of one-shot you or, like, stunlock you until you're dead. So I'm not promising we'll do it on our first try. Let's say there's, like, an 80% chance we'll do it on our first try. Also, God, I, I mentioned this last stream, but I'm saying this because a lot of people here weren't here last time. Um, I have heard from people who should know that... There was some version of Bloodborne where the um, the people in the walls were still alive and they were like moving and trying to grab you, like twitching. And oh, okay, it's not even. It's not a Sinclair wall stream of that.
Yeah, so apparently, like, there were, um, like, character models of those people, and they'd be like, when you were near them. I'm just bringing out Tal to make sure this works a little better. I don't know why. Um, a, a lot of, like, map sort of coolness, from what I can tell, was cut out, and I think it was to do with, like, the map files themselves getting a little complicated. Another, like, thing I'll just bring up now, because whatever, they also put stuff last stream, but, um, those Bell Maidens there, they're actually the Vicar Amelia model, retextured. So, if you look at this in a map viewer, there's all these copies of Vicar Amelia's pendant underneath the arena. Because they animate her, and then they just get the pendant and make it out of, like, basically just put it out of bounds so you don't see it. But, yeah, anyway, we've all seen this before. Like, can I skip that? I can't skip. Oh, I can skip. Okay, good. The only things I think from it actually censored would be the Ocelot thing in Dark Souls 3, where um, he just like spikes a baby into the ground and splatters it. Because I feel like that's probably something that they would have said, no, you know, you can't do this. And that's Because it's not like they cut Ocelot out. The, um, the absence of Ocelot actually just makes the fight very confusing to understand. So I think Ocelot, that may be an actual instance of something being censored. But I don't, they don't, I mean, obviously they don't shy away from things being really grotesque. And like, um, uh, harm to children is something that is kind of like frequently censored in games. Like if, um, particularly, like if you're German and you played Fallout 2, they removed. They they made all the children in the game immortal. Um, the kids in Fallout Three, I think they're all immortal. I remember um, Resident Evil Two. There's like a part where you play as Sherry, the the like 14 year old girl, and they made Sherry like an absolute tank in terms of hit points because they didn't want the, they wanted it to, like you can still technically die, but they wanted the kid like to not die and not. I get complaints about her being like having her head caved in by a cramp. Hello, am I streaming? I'm streaming till I've... I'll probably basically do like... I'm less than halfway through now, so... We are gonna have to kill one reborn again, I think, later on. He's just a massive... Well, he's, a, he's conceptually and also gameplay-wise just a massive... It just it takes tons of damage and is not particularly interesting. Well, it doesn't help that, like, I've got, um. I look like it's like half my health off and I'm level 200, like, this thing is a beast. Um. Like, my weapon, because of the way I'm doing this, is level. it's plus 6, and I think they're expecting something close to, like, plus 8 at this point, and I've got no blood gems. So. Having summoned it until it's got more health. Yeah. 
going on. Reborn! I like how Reborn has become this thing within the thing within the, the channel, and like we've not fucking watched Reborn for like four years. Okay, good, we have a lamp. So What we're gonna do now is Yes sir. And yeah, I was actually going to do this, um, oh, I was actually going to do this tomorrow, but basically Sin is quite sick. Which means that, like, we couldn't record tonight, so I'm basically, I moved this ahead a day to just give us something to do tonight. Um, that's why she's not here. And more chance of DS. I really want to do more Dark Souls 2 content. The thing is, like, Sin and I just, we don't have the time, because this is not a full-time job. So we're basically limited to, like, what can we record in a weekend. So it's basically, like, we're, we're reduced to, like, maybe two or three episodes um, recorded a week if they're short, and, like, maybe one a week if they're long. You know what we actually have to do for Dark Souls 2? Um, we did the Queens of Dark Souls 2 with Asa, and we did two episodes out of four, and then Sin just kind of forgot about it. So we have to go back and we have to do Alsana. And then we have to do Nishandra. We just haven't got around to it yet. I might actually put the Yahagul set on. Okay. I have no idea what's on Patreon anymore since just moving things. So yeah, Dark Souls, Dark Souls 2, I'm glad, has gotten, like, a, um... I don't know. I don't know what the word is, because it's not quite like... Like, it was always generally like, but there were these sort of criticisms of it that... They're criticisms that make sense if you assume it's just supposed to be Dark Souls 1 again. But, um, it's not. It's its own thing. And I guess it's so it's kind of been reappraised, yeah. Okay, here we go. So this is the first like weird thing we're showing off, which is it is the blood moon. But that one's gonna still be here. And you see like it looks slightly off because the material on Gascoin's model is like not really designed to interact with this skybox. So he looks very sort of weird and flat. Yeah, I think your reevaluation is a good word because I think the general sense is like when it came out, it was this isn't like Dark Souls One, and then it gradually became well, it doesn't have to be; it's its own thing. And I think Dark Souls Three was a big part of that because when Dark Souls Three came out, it was so much like Dark Souls One that that was one of the criticisms of it. Anyway, here we go. So, he's not much of a threat to us because we're like level 200. He's like barely scratching us, so I just want to get up here and show everybody the skybox. But yeah, we are we are in the red moon. And we're fighting guess what? Even like the failed parries are doing a ton of damage.
I should I reckon hang on. If we can successfully parry him, we will probably God damn it. Sweet blood. Oh, it seems to me. It's enough to make a man sick. Okay, come on. Ah. If you sometimes you can kill him so quickly if he just like he never goes into beast form. He just dies. Well, the, the thing about the Soul, this is in response to like, what Wesley's saying. The thing about the Soul series is, like, on a certain level, all the games are very, very similar. But then there's all these little tiny granular differences that make or break them for some people. It reminds me of, like, how there's, like, fighting games that have all these different versions, and, like, if you don't know anything about them, like, it's the same game. And then someone's like, no, they changed the parry timing, or, like, they changed how iframes work, or they... This character's thing goes for slightly longer, or something like that. Anyway, so... Now... We've been building up to for the last, god, 51 minutes, I apologize, is... It is now back to afternoon, or oh, evening. Not evening, but if this worked, yeah, Kaya knows about fighting games. Like you'll be able to explain this to people. Now, hopefully, this works out. Yep, at that plaza. Ta-da! So this is Yahoo goal during the afternoon. And because the uh, the enemies are tied to times of day, they don't spawn. So we just have we just wander around Yahoo goal. And it's actually it is quite pretty looking. See, again, like I'm saying of the material effects, like, you're not supposed to be here at this time of day, so things like that tree, they're not really optimized to be looked at in this light, like, stands out quite a bit. And this is why we had to run through and beat one reborn, because when you reset the time, this shuts again. Like, this is tied to the time of day, so if we had not have beaten one reborn, we would not be able to get back here. And the other thing is that um, the elevators don't work if you reset time, so there's no way to use the shortcut back. So this is the only way you can get into the second half. I wish I'd gotten a Doctorate in Elden Ring or a bit more fucking useful than one I have now, which may as well be toilet paper. Do these work? Yeah, so you can't use the transport baths either. Ladders work, I think. Yeah, ladders work. Ladders work, but the transport baths and the elevators don't. Let's have a look around. There's nothing particularly like... This section's mostly indoors. They can't show off much, but... Oh, you got your masturbation in World of Warcraft ethnography! That's great! I wish I was that cool. I just wrote about fetish comics. I didn't even do a very good job. But no one else had read them, so there was no one to challenge me. Anyway. 
Uh, we can go to the second part as well. Hang on. Actually, that's nice. This is uh, presumably what it looked like when they were all performing the ritual. Also head back to And the problem is the door is gonna be shut. So we're either gonna the door to your hug from your huggle to cathedral will be shut. So in order to make it nice again, we're either gonna have to kill Cleric Beast or go through Old Yarnum, and I'm thinking about what I wanna do because if we go through all the iron, we'll be able to see Upper Cathedral Ward. Okay, my fetish comic work was so bad to me that when they wanted me to write an article on it, I said I wouldn't because <laughs> I was like so over it at that point. It's not, it was not good. It was just like no one was there to say I was doing a bad job. Anyway, here we go. This is more Yaha Gold during the evening. I mean, like, it's nothing. Yeah, there's no amygdala. Uh, there's no enemies at all. Go down here. This is the elevator that doesn't do anything. Like, this elevator, you can see, like, it's here, but if I'm standing on it, it doesn't do anything. And again, like you can see that the the kind of metal stuff at the top, it's gone like blue. Because again, it's not really like this lighting is very strange. It's got this like blue reflection coming off from something. Because usually you only come here at night. Yeah, we can sort of wander around this main street. Um, I think I may actually go through all the Arnhem now. This shouldn't take long because I can pretty much just demolish anything. The thing is, I have I have a very good article uh, on uh, Dark Souls that's not been published yet because the it's it was accepted into a book, but the book hasn't been published yet. Um, I think they're still waiting on some submissions, so I can't actually show it to anyone yet. Yeah, I, I have an art, uh, it's a, um, there's a series called Pop Culture and Philosophy. It's sort of about using, like, pop culture texts to explain philosophical concepts. And I have a, a chapter in one of the upcoming ones about Dark Souls and queer theory. But the problem is that, um, I can't, like, it's not been published yet, so I can't <laughs> give anyone a copy or, like, yeah. Yeah, with Sin and I were talking like when it finally comes out, uh, we will do like we'll do an episode on it because it's really just reiterating a bunch of stuff I've already said. Um, but it was a bit more coherent because I only had about four thousand words. Of it. Asa has a, an article in that book as well about uh, stagnation as a philosophical concept. I don't know who else is, is in it. It's not out yet.
I just, I just want it to be published so that can be the final word on Gwendolyn and I never have to answer any questions about them again. And yeah, there's our statue. I'll explain the statue on the way down, just because I have nothing to say about all the Arnhem, because we've everyone's been through this area hundreds of times already. So that statue. That statue was not there when the game launched. It actually appeared in, I think it was version 1.07, the floating statue appeared. And there's this whole thing about, like, why is there a floating statue there? What happened? And um, as someone who's gone through the map data, um, the reason it is there, I think, is that there is, like, a fog emitter. There's, like, this sort of object that emits this, like, fog and, like, a sort of atmospheric noise that is in exactly the same location, like it has the same XYZ coordinates. And I think what's happened is at some point, the coordinates of the emitter just got given to the statue. I don't know why that happened or how it happened, but they occupy the same space. So, I, or it like got attached to it or something. I don't know if the engine uses like a, like a node structure or something, but yeah, it, it's been, um, accidentally, like, got shoved up there. Yeah, yeah. Why am I going this way? I don't need a shotgun. Oh, you're pregnant to be out of it. Oh, wow. Yeah, when I was, um, when I was doing my PhD initially, like, ten years ago, uh, there were a bunch of people doing, uh, MMO-focused things, so, like, it's clearly something a lot of people are really interested in. I might actually just... I have this perpetual fear that, like, I won't open a shortcut and I'll get there and then I'll like get killed and have to run through the whole area again. So let's just open this to be safe. Oh, there's fire paper up here as well. Hey, we're in business. Oh yeah, I, I do stuff in Blender, like very low poly stuff, and um, I'm I'm aware of all the many many things that can potentially go wrong. And want some antidote just in case. Now like okay, these like real nerd hours here. A lot of people will be aware that like there's this scourge beast here that's got the red eyes, and it's just like a unique enemy. Okay, it's not a unique enemy. Uh, what's happening is this thing. When it sees you, it does this screaming attack. And what the screen does is the screen is actually a buff that affects all the beasts within its radius and it gives them the red eyes. That's also where the ones in the chapel have the red eyes because when you drop into the chapel, the beast goes and they all get the buff. I didn't bring any cocktails, did I? No, okay. Oh, we should be okay. The Celestial Emissary has a buff, which a lot of people don't know about. Um, because they kill it so quickly, they never see it do it. And it only works in the Upper Cathedral Ward version. The, um, Chalice version will never do it. It, it, it buffs the little the little dudes that follow it around, which don't exist in the chalices. I 
could hit once. What I mean about like I'm actually okay at this game when I'm not trying. I'm just like, oh, just get this over with, I'm like hyper efficient. So we'll start by going up to show you what Upper Cathedral Ward looks like. Here in the evening. Because we grabbed it, we can actually go through here and visit up a cathedral ward during the evening. So, what does it look like during the evening? We've got the very nice red sky that we associate, not the pale blood sky, but the sort of red evening sky. You might think, oh, okay, we'll get the whole the whole of uh, up a cathedral ward in that sort of lovely, lovely sort of. No, no, we don't. Uh, the sky just disappears. So literally, it just doesn't have a sky. It's just grey. Could kind of pass this off as maybe it's just really overcast, but uh, no, it has no sky. Because they do not intend you to be here. Other than that, it pretty much behaves the same. There's really nothing. It's not like we get different enemies or anything. Everything still loads. Just, uh, there is no sky at all. Oh, actually, while I'm up here, they're done. Let's get ready to turn. We're getting to the point where, like, uh, even though I have very high stats, having an unupgraded weapon, not really helpful. So, kind of hard to see. Uh, because I didn't- I haven't got the monocular, and I'm really sorry, but if you look down there... Um, in sort of the center of the screen, you can see there's a gap. Actually, hang on, we'll, we'll, there's a better way of showing this off. We might do this, uh, another time. I'll show that off after I'm done with Amelia, because I have to go through there to get to her. But basically, you can see the old structure that this area used to have, because they didn't update the- the, um, the distance models. If you look at it from the distance, you can see, you can kind of see it here as well, like, um, that's sort of the way you get to Yahagul, but you can see it's slightly different, like there's a gargoyle there instead of a well, and there's this, um, sort of wooden structure. I'll grab the monocular on the way back and we can do this properly. Oh no, I've got to go down, Christ, okay. We're coming to the hardest boss in the game, which is the drop. Which I can never make consistently. And I've gone the wrong way. Oh, 
The hardest bosses in the game are this drop and Mikolash. Who gave us quite a lot. Al Altair and I were playing this last night. Not last night, a couple of days ago. And um, Christ, Mikolash. New Game Plus Mikolash is not to be fucked with. It's basically like you're fighting a landmine that will randomly go off. And there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, here we go. See, everyone has trouble here. It's not just me. So we're going to try to land on this and throw <sighs> Whew! I think Halo was uh, doing the Elden Ring version of this earlier, and she's like, Is, are they serious? <laughs> the Frenzied Flame area, we have to drop down all the little coffins, and it's just like, good god. Elden Ring is bizarre in that, like, they finally added a dedicated jump button and then they add the single worst jumping puzzle they've ever done. That said, I do know someone who did actually do that puzzle on their first try. Okay, so... Um... now night time. So. We can go to Yaha Gore, but I actually want to grab the monocular first. Hello, Ollie. Feel free to ask any questions in chat, by the way, because, like, I, I don't have anyone to talk to, and I'm not good at filling in time uh, when there's nothing to say.
Oh yeah, for anyone who cares, hang on. If you get the monocular and you look at the description of it, it says used to view things up close. And that's why that series was called Bloodborne Up Close, because of the monocular. It wasn't actually meant to be like... This is the deepest look ever. Oh hey, hi Luna! So yeah, we're now going to go to Yahagul during the night time. We're getting a lot of uh, um, people I know here who weren't at the last one because we're doing this at a different time of day. Insane and event closer. Through the minute. Uh, the Elden Ring version was going to be called Far Away Things because that's what the um, the telescope says. I was pushing ACCs on Twitter. Here we go. So this is Yahagol at night time. Actually, we can prop... Maybe, now that we've got the monocular, we can have a, maybe a nicer look at it. Do I think Bloodborne would have been better if it was released on PS3 and do as a redesign? I don't know. If, was it ever made for PS3? I thought it was designed to be PS4 from the beginning. It was in development a long time, though. It would have started before then. Yeah, the buildings are very tilted. You can see it's all like sort of warped and melting and broken. It also, hang on. These are very, very close to the worm faces from Elden. It's like beautiful. It's a shame we never see this normally. Look at that, like the the way that the rays are passing through the the like the, the railing at the top, it looks great. And you never see this. I'm actually wondering if, like, this is, um, some, like, unused thing. Because they went through so many, like, you, Luna will know this, because you work with, with 
abyss on the stuff he's doing with all the lighting and everything, but like, there's all these like unused lighting setups for Bloodborne, and this this might even be one of them. Like this might be. I don't think it doesn't normally look that silver. Like, it looks beautiful. We'll probably get it behind him. Oh, look at that. That's amazing. Like it's clearly like not realistic lighting, but it doesn't matter. It's like it looks it looks like like a film. Like, it, like its expression is it's amazing. It's incredible. So we'll just check out the other part. My controller sometimes comes out of the socket. I have like a kind of busted controller. So when I'm trying to charge it, it'll like start doing that. Um, we are. Uh, we don't have shining coins, do we? No, we're gonna have to get. I think it's a Ludwig badge that is the shining coins. The next part's of work. Look, yeah, like, look at that. I think the moon is sort of like this particular lighting setup. It's it's underutilized in the game because basically as soon as you get this time of day, your next goal is Forbidden Woods, so you don't see Yarnum during it. And then after Forbidden Woods, the the red moon happens. So like you actually don't really see much of Yarnum in the sort of the moonlight. Which is weird because that's so much of like what the game is about is like the moon and like the, the sort of like horror, the sort of gothic like city bathed in the pale moonlight. And you don't actually really see much of that. What time is it? In the game or in real life? <laughs> In the game, it's the time it is after V. Lawrence's memory, and in real life, it is 11.30pm on the 27th of March in Eastern Australia. So I'll show you also like why I had to do this. Um, because now that we're in the nighttime, the door, which is like contingent on the time of day, is locked. It's like this this will lead us back into the chapel where the amygdala is, but we don't get an open prompt. Like we can't do anything about it, we can never go through the door again. So that's why we had to make sure we have certain lanterns tagged, because just doors will not open, they'll stay locked. Yeah, again, look how gorgeous this is. A lot of the buildings in the distance there, they're actually just 2D flats. Like, there's just, like, a, a picture of a building, and they just sort of stack them in rows to, like, bulk out the skyline. So there's not actually a 3D model at all, but you don't notice, because it's far enough away. But that's... Look, look at that. Get this amygdala with the... And a halo of light around it. And there's still like weird places like this where I, I know it's coming from that, but it's expecting you to be here at a different time of day, so the lighting's not really optimized. But like, God, this is gorgeous. You have like like the the blue of the moon and the like the the orange street lamps, and it's like it's a shame you never get to see this normally. You only get here by glitching. Anyway. So we're almost done. I just want to show off a couple of things then. We'll do another one of these where we play with the boss order. So first thing I want to do actually is...
the reason I'm doing this is I want to grow. You can also see, like, again, um, this is nighttime and there's just no sky. A little bit more of a look around. Yeah, there's, like, just no sky whatsoever. Hemwick, um, Hemwick won't care. Um, but, like, this place, like, it's designed for the red sky and we don't have it. So, it's just, like, a void. There's nothing here. And there's, like, no sort of lighting. It's all very grey. Um, but other than that, it's, it's the same. So, what I want to do now is... So what I wanted to show off is... I always thought I was playing Elden Ring and I'm like, I can control the telescope. I can't. Actually kind of hard to see this little rails in the way. You can see there's like a gap there. And there's like a, um, a doorway there. That's actually the path you take from Amelia to Yahuggle. So like Amelia's boss door is kind of over here, and if you just keep running, like you just run through there and pass there, and there's no gap and there's no elevator. And that's because that elevator, it used to connect to Upper Cathedral Ward, and what would happen is because there's a gap in the floor, you had to go to Upper Cathedral Ward, and then take the elevator down, and that's how you got to Yaha Gul. So there was no way to get there um, by just running, but you can just run. Now what I might actually do here is we can show this off a little better. We're gonna have to go back to the drain set. Uh, uh, hey, them from. Okay, good. So we have Radiant Sword Hunter badge. So what we're gonna do now is. But you can do what I'm about to do at any time, it's not contingent on you having the, um, the time zone messed up. But I may as well show it off now, just because I can. Quite a lot of things you can see from Upper Cathedral Ward that aren't in the game anymore, because it's using an old version of Yarnum for the, for the distance. Uh, with time manipulations about half done, I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna revert the save and do it again, and we'll, we'll fight, uh, Amelia. And, um, Eileen at the same time. So, I should be able to buy shining coins now. Yes. So, I want to go to... Okay, um, so Zeno's asking, is the route for having to go up and down the elevator something that still exists in the map files? Yeah, the elevator is still there. Um, it's actually kind of interesting when you look at it, because you can see, like, how, how sort of hastily they've actually patched the hole up. Hang on. So I'll just lay out some shining coins. So initially, like... It would just stop here, so we'll just we'll just put some coins down, sort of mark out the boundary. So initially, this would be not here, and we'll just lay some. Down. Hey, a Abacab DK.
And see, this is where that door was, and if you look at it, it kind of, it almost looks like it should be an illusory wall, because it's just this, like, completely flat thing with, like, a brick texture applied. So we'll just shove some things here, so we know where we are. Let's go further on towards the Go all the way down. I just want to give a rough idea of where everything is. So. The good thing about shining coins is you can see them from very far away. Like, they keep their relative position. And you can use them to show, like, where a bunch of just weird crap was in the game. There's one more thing I want to mark out down here. There's a specific door. Just for reference, this is where, like, the, um, that's the sort of, the, the open door that takes you on the way to Forbidden Woods, so, that is a mark just now. The intro song of this stream is called Weirdness Oh No, and it's by a... British, kind of Andy Kaufman-esque comedian called Ted Chippington. And he just sort of mashed up a bunch of stuff he'd said with an episode of Thunderbirds. I was trying to think of something I could play that wouldn't get as copyright claimed, and I don't think uh, Ted Chippington is going to be bothered. Who was using the library in Erden Chapel? Um, okay, so we actually recorded with Loki about this. And, um, Loki, like, we, we sort of, like, we used to think it was it Viola, was it, like, someone from the School of Mensis, because they mentioned a lost master, and, like, that's Mikolash's title. Um, Loki said it's probably just someone who worships Erden. And the lost master they're talking about is just Erden. But, like, the Bergenworth spider is hiding, like, the ritual, and that is stopping Erden from manifesting. So he said it's probably just someone who worships Erden. So I'm fine with that, because it's, it's a very odd thing, because clearly not the chapel dweller didn't write it. Um, and no one else is... How these things take down? No one else is, like, in there. And it probably wasn't Viola. Unless Viola's, like, a secret Mensis agent, which I'm sure is someone's headcanon. Uh, okay. Also helps remember that, like, Erden, Erden just seems to be the name of that area. Like, they don't necessarily know that it's a, um, it's like Yarnum being named after the Thumerian Queen. Like, the people that live there don't necessarily know who it's named after, they just know it as a place called Yarnum. Okay, here we go. You can see, there's all the shiny coins we left. So there is like where I said move across. There's where the barret that's where the, the sort of edge is. It's very hard. Oh, it's probably very easy to see like here. But yeah, there you can see the shining coins have laid out the path. And the path clearly crosses something it shouldn't cross. And you can see that like round that mass of statues where I put all the the shining coins, like that's where the door is. And if you look it up at that. See, that's Lumen. That's like, to give you a rough idea of where we are, that's the clock, obviously. Lumenflower Gardens is behind that, so like the Celestial Emissary is kind of in here. So that, that was the elevator that went from Lumenflower Gardens down. And it would continue around, you can see, you can kind of see where the coins are. Not very well. 
and see that what would happen is you'd go into Luminflower Gardens, go down the elevator, and you'd get to this area which you couldn't normally get to because there's a gap in the way. And then that would lead you down to roughly where your hardcore is. Now quickly before I go from here, there's a little thing I want to show off. Let me see if I can find it. No, that'll show me up. That's a good place to look at it from. Let me over here. There we go. So that's where the the giant is, the sleeping giant, that when you go through, like you enter the, the sort of back street area of Cathedral Ward. There's a door there. Like it's not it's not just an archway, there's actually a door built into it. And it's entirely possible that was like the password door or something. We're not 100% sure. But you can see like there is a door there. And like, again, I, I didn't, I didn't want to subject everyone to doing it. But basically, if you go up and you take the rooftop path and you lay shining coins down, it doesn't match what you're seeing there. Like they've moved everything around. You can also see that like um, that building there like that should really there should be another building down there and a ladder and it's not there like they've really changed up the way in which you progress through this area from when this was made but yeah there's that there's that door and let's go back down again so we can get a better look at your hoggle That's the stairs you take down to Yaha Gol. And see, that's where there's a well. And you can see that, like, the basic structure of the plaza is still there. But the well is this gargoyle. And that area there... Uh, that's sort of where, like, the, the executioners are patrolling and there's the snipers and everything. There's this, like, wooden structure. You can kind of just make it out. There's these, like, wooden bridges... They just aren't there anymore. It's like you can that's like an old version of that pathway there. Um the other thing, everyone kind of knows this now, but the abandoned old workshop, like that's the tree that comes from it. And if you lay coins at the workshop and then you walk back here, the coins appear over here. So like the the original workshop location was like here. And it sort of got yanked back to here. Like, that's the workshop there. You can actually see it quite well. Um, if you leave coins along there, they'll actually appear over here. So like, a lot of, like, the relative positions of things got moved around. Anyway, that is all I can do on this file. So what we're going to do is... We're going to... Redownload our save. And this will set us all the way back to the clinic. This also, by the way, gives a little insight into what it's like being someone who does Bloodborne wiki stuff. As you can see, I instead of just having Bloodborne, I have Bloodborne, Bloodborne, and Bloodborne, and they're all slightly different versions. So let's go Bloodborne. So if this worked, uh, we'll just be back at the clinic again with everything reset to how it was. I've been using this character for... I don't even know how long. She's my go-to, like, if Meth needs something checked, uh, I just grab her. Because she can get anywhere in the game pretty quickly. Um, I've heard of Chard Thermos. Um, I haven't actually watched it yet, but I know Meph's written it up. So one day, one day I will. So, yeah, we're back where we started. Cool. So, uh, 
Now we're going to do it slightly differently. So what we're going to do here is we're going to trigger Eileen. Oh, you know, I, I really like this character's look, actually. The little Andy Warhol ball. She's supposed to be a vile blood. That's why she's got, like, the very silver hair and the very, very, like, pale skin. Well, this is before I really got the hang of the character creator, so she's slightly green in some places. So we can either fight Eileen and Amelia, or the Bloody Crow and Amelia, and I think because it's gone quite well so far, uh, let's do the Bloody Crow and Amelia to create, like, just this incredible mess. Okay, so, um, them Hrum is talking about, like, a quest trigger that I'll talk about, like, um... We'll talk about it while we're setting this up because there's really nothing new. We're not going to see anything different for a very long time. So basically the way that um, Eileen's quest works is that once you've interacted with her, that sort of starts her. And then if you enter Forbidden Woods and she hasn't... If you enter Forbidden Woods and you've beaten Henrik, it progresses her quest to be like the Bloody Crows in the Cathedral. And if you go down there having not beaten Henrik, it progresses her quest to her being blood drunk in the cathedral. Um, and you'd think that would mean, okay, if you're doing this sort of thing, where you're like going into the back of Yosefka's clinic and everything, would that trigger her quest line? And the answer is it doesn't because you don't see the Forbidden Woods title card. Right, so that makes sense. But, patches. Catches the spider is has a trigger that makes him appear behind the next window you see um, when you... Well, okay, you would think that what makes Patches appear is that he's behind the first window you see after entering Forbidden Woods, like that would make sense, but he's not. Because if you just go inside of the little Yusefka's Clinic cave, but don't trigger the Yusef don't trigger the Forbidden Woods title card. Um, patches will still appear, but you won't you won't have progressed Eileen's quest line. Like it's it's extremely convoluted and it's only relevant in this run that you normally can't ever do. But yeah, it's like their triggers are different, and I suspect, like, patches probably, like, they had not settled on how he was going to work until pretty late in the day. Oh, what's that smell? There we go. Didn't even see these mode. Yeah, that's what, yeah, exactly. We saved him. We saved Gascoin. He didn't have to die in indignity. That's whatever. I think I have an arcane gem lying around somewhere we could probably use. Oh no, I didn't because I didn't grab any gems when I was in the cave. Okay. 
so. Okay, yeah, so the Yarnamites being transformed is like, it's sort of two, there's two, like, aspects to that. Um, the ones that are just very, very hairy. That is just how they look. Like, the, the notion that, like, they're quite um, hairy, they have distended limbs and things. The ones who just straight up look like beasts, um, it looks a lot like they were actually meant to be beasts at some point. Like, Yarnamites would transform. Um, like, during the game. That's why you'd see these, like, other beasts that looked like they had, like, scraps of clothing on them. And they ended up not going with it, and they just made them into regular enemies. But those enemies are strange, because they, they will, like, um, for example, they will, f um, they will chase pungent blood cocktails, I think. Or they're, like, weak to serrate. Like, they have some beast qualities, but not others. I can't remember exactly, but we did test it. I think they chase pungent blood cocktails and they're weak to serrated, but at the same time they don't mechanically count as a beast for beast damage bonuses. It's just so confusing. There's a lot of different damage multipliers in this game that frankly don't matter at all. <laughs> it does not matter. Like there's like beast damage and serrated damage, which you'd think would be the same thing but aren't. Even though they described as the same, you'd think that like they would just function the same way, but no. Like I'm essentially doing a pacifist run. I'm just ignoring every enemy. I'm doing this so we don't have to um go through all the armor things. Just want to open the game. Oh yeah, they, they, like, I'm pretty sure, like, they just don't really care because they're obsessed with, like, outsiders. So as long as you're, like, a Yarnamite, they don't care. But at the same time, like, um, they, they clearly wanted to have the Yarnamites and the Beasts fight each other. And it doesn't get implemented until the DLC, and I pointed this out last stream when we were doing it, but, like, the DLC impl implementation of that is basically that the Yarnamites will start facing a wall and then there'll be a trigger that as you approach makes them turn around and that's how they do it because if they're just patrolling the map they just start fighting stuff like without you um without you having any control over it so i think they would have just killed each other there we go uh yeah the cleric beasts jump um the Cleric Beast technically starts out, like, inside a wall, and just sort of goes whoop, boing, like that. Whereas, um, the reason it does that, it's just how loud I was back then, the reason it does that is because its initial entrance was going to be from the, the balcony in the cathedral. Like, the way that you get to Abriatus, it was going to be there, and it was going to jump through the window, and that's why the window is broken. And it goes down, and um, yeah, it, it they when they moved it to the bridge, they just made it jump from inside the bridge. Yeah, like in the cinematic. Yeah, it was gonna be like um. It would leap down. There's actually the, the cutscene is still in the game. Um, Lance restored it. It's on uh, Bloodborne Wiki. Actually, we can watch it. <laughs> when I when this ends and I start like showing off what's on Bloodborne Wiki to convince you to give it money, uh, I will show you that cutscene. I 
And yeah, because I, I mentioned it. Um, we're doing this to raise money for the continued maintenance of Bloodborne Wiki. Which, um, it doesn't run ads, it's not hosted on Fandom or Fextra or Wiki or anything like that. It's entirely Neff's doing. She is paying for all the hosting, she's writing all the code, she's writing most of the pages herself. Um, and the other ones she's at least, like, she's involved in putting them together and she can write them. So, that's obvious, like, it costs money to host things and it's a huge time investment as well. So if you could keep Neff, like five bucks or ten bucks at that little link down there. Um, that's just on Buy Me A Coffee, she doesn't have a Patreon or anything, so if you just want to kick us some money on Buy Me A Coffee just to keep the thing running, that would be great. And just, you know, to sort of, you know, make up for the fact that, like, she's frequently, like, essentially working overtime to keep this thing up and running. And she deserves it. She deserves more than she's getting. I don't think we'll get a Bloodborne 2, really. I think we'll get, like, something that is the successor to Bloodborne. Um, but not... Not literally Bloodborne 2. In the way that, like, this started off as the sequel to Demon Souls, and then it became its own thing. We'll end up with, like, the third one in this, like, spiritual successor to Bloodborne. What, what would the sequel to Bloodborne even be, is the question? It's like, Bloodborne, by the end of it, like, you've gone from the beginning of human history to the creation of a new universe, so I don't know what you even go after. Where do you go after that? I just realized I'm doing this wrong. I want to keep Amelia alive. Sorry. Sorry. That was a mistake. Oh, Blood if Bloodborne 2 was sci-fi, like, that would be... Like, I can see that working. Okay, we almost fucked that up by killing Amelia. We don't want to do that. We actually wanted to do this. Just muscle memory at this point, so I've played it so often. He wants to. Hello. Oh, well, perfect. Not Henrik. And he... Okay, so Eileen's like, hey, don't, don't, don't mess with Henrik. So we're gonna mess with Henrik. Oh, Amelia, like, she... Well, okay, this is interesting, actually. Amelia does this, like, prayer thing to, like, buff herself up. And it's basically what the Bloodstarved Beast does. When it does its poison cloud. And it, it's trying to, like, draw on its blood to make itself stronger. But because its blood is rotten, it just manifests as this cloud of poisons. But when Amelia does it, because she's, like, not, not Bloodstarved, I guess. She ends up... Uh, she's kind of fine. Oh, yeah, just another little little piece of info if anyone cares. Um, oh, yeah, I know. I wish I saw the file. Ha. That's the doll's model. Um, Viola and Gascoigne's daughter, That they just used the doll retextured. You can see, like, she's got the same boots on. Um, like, she's got kind of the same, like, she's got blonde hair and she's got, like, the same sort of, like, cravat thing. Which, like, you could say, like, and this is what I've always said, like, She's dressed like that because that's how women in Yarnum dress, and that's why the doll dresses like it. But, yeah, like, that's... The, the technical answer is literally the doll's model. The other thing is, I keep clicking the stick in to sneak, like it's Elden Ring or Sekiro, which you can't do anymore. Henrik has a bunch of little interesting, like, um, quirks to him. Like, he'll do- yeah, he's doing it now, see? He'll roar, because he's going blood drunk, so he'll- he'll do the roaring. Yeah. 
so now... Last time I played Sekiro would have been... Late 2020? No, 2020. Yeah, late 2020. I played it before the DLC came out. Um, but I, I did play it. Like, I, I made a point of platinuming it. Like, I didn't have any... It was around, like, when COVID hit and no one had anything to do. So I'm just like, eh, I'm gonna... I'm gonna platinum Sekiro. Uh, so... Let's repair. I've started obsessively repairing since the last stream when my weapon broke while we were fighting Nickel Ash. Okay, so now... Because we saved Emil... Because we saved Eileen from Henrik. When we go into Red Moon phase, we should simultaneously get the Bloody Crow and Amelia in the same room. And it just becomes this absolute mess. And they can damage each other. But obviously, like, the Bloody Crows is, is so, so powerful that, um, Amelia barely scratches him and he can, like, one-shot her. The problem with durability is, like, I, Altair and I were streaming and I needed to put together a level 120 character, like, pretty quickly. So I put together this one, and just, I grabbed the first really good gem I could find, which was a cursed one. And it gave me a really big attack boost, but it also had durability down. So it was like they actually had to worry about durability. And my... If you watch it back, like it's still on the channel, my, um, my weapon broke during the Mikolash fight. And obviously that fight is so goddamn long. And it ended up like, I just went, I am going to apply Bolt Paper and just use the flat damage from the bolt paper to hurt you, and just made it. I have no idea who the Bloody Crow is. I don't think the Bloody Crow is sp supposed to be anyone. I think it's just a Knight of Kanehurst. My favourite th my favorite theory about the Bloody Crow is that it was Lawrence. And I'm like... Lawrence's skull is behind him. How does any of this make sense? <laughs> um, but he, he's just a dude. Oh, also, like, the Bloody Crow, um... I can't show- I've shown off 1.0 before. I can't now because it would involve, like, completely, like, taking everything off the PS4 and then reinstalling it and doing a bunch of shit, but... Um, I've played 1.0, and on 1.0 the Bloody Crow doesn't work. Like, he technically exists, but what will happen is he'll spawn in the map, and then I think literally what happens is... Oh, he died. Okay. Anyway, I think literally what happens with him is, like, he spawns in the map, and he falls through it. Because he'll appear, and you won't, like... He'll be obviously on the map, like he's registered as being there. But as soon as he loads, there's like nothing and then a scream and then you get the echoes as if he's dead. And I don't know why that is, but his item, I think, is still in the same position. So I think what's happening is he's actually loading like outside the map and he just falls out of bounds and dies. It's something like that. Yeah, he could be Eileen's apprentice. Um, The other thing is like prior to Maria existing... Which people, like, forget that, like, there was a period of about seven months where people were trying to, like, talk about the Bloodborne story without the old hunters. So, and in that, there's references to, like, German having an apprentice, and there's, like, connections between, like, the apprentice and the doll, and, um, like, the doll was praying at the grave of the apprentice and stuff. So, like, back then, I was like, is the apprentice the bloody crow? Like, is German's apprentice like, go to Kanehurst and fall in love with this, like, woman who then he made the doll out of. And now he's back. But then it's also, like, I mean, technically you're carrying his bone around. But even that sort of makes sense. Because, um, uh, it's the femur. And, like, there's the whole thing about people's legs being cut off. So, it's like, I guess he could have survived with one leg. You don't know that. 
But yeah, we have Maria now, so. Oh yeah, okay, so the the Madman of the Intertombs. Ludwig is Ludwig. Like, you encounter Ludwig, he's in the Nightmare, he's a weird horse monster. Um, it specifies, like, he did transform, so Ludwig wouldn't still be, like... If you did encounter Ludwig, he wouldn't be, like, Ludwig. He would be, like, a weird monster. Because that did happen to him. Um, the reason people say it's the Madman... Again, this is, like, pre-Old Hunters, we didn't have a Ludwig fight. But there was this guy in the chalices who was like, he was wearing Tomb Claw Spectre armor and he had Ludwig's weapons, so it's like, oh, maybe that's Ludwig. And like, again, there was no Old Hunters. It's it's a you know possible way of explaining what the hell was going on. But um, yeah, we know now. I think that dude is just a madman. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, the Elden Ring DLC, like, I'm predicting it's gonna comp- it'll rewrite our understanding of, like, probably, um, I want to say Melina, because, like, okay, so, the, what I should be doing right now, and I'm not, because Sin is sick, is we should be recording about Melina and the Glomide Queen. Um... And the thing, like, that I, I've got in my notes for, for when we record about that is, like, the Glomide Queen story feels like a story that is half-finished. I don't mean that, like, it's an unfinished story because, like, you know, it's just, like, not done or something. I mean, it feels like it's part one and we need to get part two to sort of fill it in. And I suspect, like, they will go somewhere with that if it is about, like, death and stuff. So I'm thinking, like, the exact relationship between the Glomide Queen and Melina will become, like, part of that story. Um, also, like, Mikola, but again, like, Mikola's so missing. Like, they cut so much of Mikola out that I don't know if it would change our, our feelings about him or just, um, just fill in the gaps that we don't have. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, ask me about Elden Ring, it's fine. Because I've got tons and tons and tons of Elden Ring notes just lying around. Because I don't... The problem is, like, obviously I like Bloodborne a lot, um, probably more than Elden Ring. But, like, what happened is, because Bloodborne was the first game I ever did a serious project with, all my Bloodborne, like, notes and footage and everything ended up, like, a mess. And I learned from that how to handle Elden Ring. So, like, our Elden Ring stuff's actually very efficient. Like, we have a very good sort of production line going on, but I feel bad that, like, I wasn't able to give that degree of, like, um... that degree of... of care and attention to Bloodborne, because obviously, like, Bloodborne is... is, like, still number one for me. And I know Meth feels that way as well, and that's why she's always working on the wiki, because she's like, I know how to do this properly now, so I'm just gonna go back and do it. The problem is, if, you, if you've got YouTube videos up, they just stay up. It's not like we can go back and like change what I'm saying in one of them, we have to make the whole video again. Okay. I am good. Um, I am handling this well, I think. This wasn't supposed to happen. Um, basically, this was supposed to happen in a couple of days' time. But um, Sin is sick. So, this is time I'm supposed to be recording with Sin, but she's not available. So, I'm sort of doing this um, instead of that, and then might record with Sin on the evening of and would have done this if she's filling up to that.
So, um, little, I guess, I brought this up last time uh, with Altair, but I know a lot of people here weren't there uh, when we did that. So, Shadows of Yarnum currently drop Blood Rapture, but if you play the game on version 1.0, they don't drop anything. Um, but it's not quite that simple, because it's not that they don't drop anything, it's that they, they drop nothing, but the game registers them as having dropped something. So what will happen is you won't get anything for killing them. But then, if you go into, say, like, if you patch the game and you play through it again, you still can't get Blood Rapture because the game registers you as having killed the Shadows of Yarnum and gotten a drop, so you'll still never get Blood Rapture. And, um, I think the reason that is, is that I know that there is another version of this where they dropped the key to the Bergenworth door. Like, instead of there just being a fog wall, there was, like, a locked door and you had to, to kill them and they dropped the key that opened it. And they were called the Keepers of the Secret instead of the Shadows of Yarnum. I did light the Bergenworth lamp, didn't I? We'll find out soon. Oh, shit, Fury. Oh, no. Yeah, like, there's no reason for you to not be able to get multiple copies of the same rune, because, like, why does it matter? I am very, very worried right now. Oh, this is a mess. Okay, never mind. I got the key. Now I have a hard feeling I didn't properly tank the lamp. And we're gonna end up back at, like, Forbidden Woods lamp. I don't remember what I did. I'm running off muscle memory. My eye is twitching. Oh no, we did hit the lamp. Good, thank god. Okay. So. Oh, the weirdest system in the game. Okay, this is this is the strangest. Um, every single blood dreg in the game is actually a unique item. Like it doesn't show up that way because you can stack them, like they're just treated like a consumable. But as far as like the game itself is concerned, every blood dreg is unique. And they're all, like, bespoke coded. Sometimes Yuri falls out of the sky after you, because she didn't like it. What's my hurt wrong with? Nothing. Okay, the bug things, they're just called the Gardens of Eyes. And the implication, like, now, is that they're, like, Bergenworth people who transformed. Um, but, early on, um, it looks like they were, they may actually have been, like, Yaseka. Like, the Yaseka character second form, because they're, they're wearing the white robes of the Healing Church. As are the weird, um... There's like, you, some people don't see them because they're Chalice exclusive, but there's these these beast things called the Lauren Clerics that just look like, they're like a beast in a robe. And like, they were initially like, on the surface. They're like, there's a lot of data for them, there's photos of them. They just don't do it anymore. Um, so I think like the idea is like, they're wearing the same robe, so they would have been like, just showing you like that the, the Healing Church could turn into different things.
Oh my god. I done this. You, you can't hit Queen Yana, I've tried. Doesn't do anything. Okay, so if this worked. We say that a lot if this worked. We should... Actually, let's just walk here. I'm bothered running back. Oh yeah, yeah, so when, when, god, when the game first came out, we didn't have official enemy names. So you can find a lot of, like, wikis and things from that period of time that will call them Mego, the Garden of Ice Mego, because they, like, resemble the Lovecraft Mego. But, um, no, they're just Garden of Ice. Um, the Fextra wiki came up with its own names for everything, and they stuck in a lot of cases. Like, I remember, um, the, the Canehurst ghost, they were called the Bound Widows. A, a lot happened before we had official names. And, like, the, the Huntsman's Minions, like, the big, uh, the big Shrek guys, they were called, like, Brick Troll. People still call them Brick Trolls to this day, like, it's, it's, an, it's technically an accurate description of them. Brain trusts, yes, Jesus Christ. Getting flashbacks to 2015. Not a good time for anyone. Did I open the gate? No. Let's wait. Oh, yeah, Fextra coming up with its own names actually did affect stuff, because I remember going, oh, Bound Widows, those are clearly the names of the ghosts, therefore... Like, and I guess, like, it's technically correct. Like, I think they are supposed to be, like, the wives or the, like, the consorts or whatever of the knights that are dead. So that sort of makes sense as a name, but... You know, I was taking that as canon. And they're literally just called Forsaken Castle Spirit now. I just want to open the shortcut back to Erden because... I don't... We're, like, we're not going to survive this fight. I can bring Henriette. I didn't okay, this is interesting. Okay, yeah, there's Eileen. Okay, good. So, clear out this guy. I did not know there was a theory that Henriette was the cleric beast. I think that doesn't work because Henriette's meant to be like she was a hunter a long time ago. 
and the cleric beast, like... Well, okay, we'll, we'll look at her when she shows up. So, like... Um... She's wearing, like, the sort of... The city... It's called, like, the, the, like the hunter... The hunter garb that's associated with, like, kind of... Like, hunters who, like, work in the city and everything. Whereas the cleric beast is implied to be, like, the captain of the church knights. Like, the, he's the holder of the, the sword badge. So you'd expect the cleric beast to be wearing, like the the like the tomb prospector's outfit or something like that or Henriette what are you doing basically you wouldn't expect although she like she has a church hammer but you'd expect her to be wearing like the something more official or like what Alfred's wearing or something Let's unplug the stupid things and plug it around under power. Okay, so yeah, this seems to be working out. So we've got Henriette, we've got Eileen. I'm afraid I will. Turn back. Okay, so if this works out. Here we go. Yeah, okay, so I, I don't know if you can make it out on the stream, but the Bloody Crow and Amelia are both in there. So, gonna be 2v2. Now, from memory, they ignore each other, but they can also damage each other. Yeah, Bloody, yeah, Bloody Crow has already, like, almost killed him. That's pretty... I wasn't expecting that. Okay. So if we, if we can get in between... Oh no, they don't... Yeah, okay, Eileen and, and Amelia can damage each other, but I don't think these two... Yeah, yeah, they're not hurting each other. There's no way we're going to do this, but it's sort of amusing to watch this movie. I think, like, if you just kited him around Amelia, he would probably kill himself with the Chikage. I don't think Shaman would be I wonder if we can, if we just keep hiding him around eventually. The problem is, like, NPC hunters have unlimited, um... They have unlimited blood vials and unlimited bullets. So we can't sort of wait in there. I think you only program to heal once, though.
And we didn't kill either of them, so they'll both still be there if we go back again. You can also do this with Eileen, like I was saying. Um, how long have we been going for? Two and a half hours. I'm trying to think of anything else we can show off with the time zones. Um, how about we do the Eileen one to like finish up? But it's a lot shorter if you're going to worry about Henrik. Yeah, there's a bunch of NPC teams. I'll actually show that off uh, when we get to showing off the wiki because someone made a big chart of like what enemy team fights what team. It's just... Oh, okay, we're actually running out of battery. Like I was saying, my uh, controller doesn't like to charge up a lot of the time. Even though it's plugged in, it'll still, like... I think it's like there's something bent or something in it, and it doesn't quite connect properly. Okay. Oh, that, that wallpaper, by the way, that's um, Allison and I's Dark Souls characters in the kiln. We went on a date in Lordran. That's a little snap from it. So we'll do the Eileen one's a lot more manageable, obviously, because they can damage each other, and Eileen's not completely broken like the bloody crow is. So we shall have to go actually trigger Eileen's quest, and then we can just run through and fight. So we have to fight Rom three times on one stream. Yeah, the bloody crow being the first hunter of hunters is like possible. Okay, see you, Bagel Gun. Bagel Gun? Bagel Gun. Bye bye. So we just have to go and, like, talk to Eileen. And then I think all you need to do is, is interact with her once. You don't have to, like, gas climb. Although, if that doesn't work out. Well, look quite the fool. Maybe we should beat Gascon because it barely takes any time just to be on the safe side. Also, got another thing right about Gaston, someone who's gone through an old version of this game. Eileen's old location was here. Like, she'd be standing here looking over the, the street, and it's like... what? Why did you move her? Like, you can't even see her from up here. Like, she's in a very, very out-of-the-way place for such a, like, important character. Like, I get it if this was, like, a secret or something, but they really expect you to find Eileen. Because she's, she, she's one of the few characters with, like, an actual in-depth quest, and it's just... You have to know to do this. And I'm really surprised she's, like, that sort of esoteric. A lot of people who didn't catch the other stream are showing up now, which I'm happy for. Oh, 
A surprise cat coming in behind me. Oh wow, you're going to Australia? That's great. Where are you going? It's it's quite a large place. Here's a funny bloodborne joke for you. My gas coin has no nose. How does he smell? The blood sings to him. I'm running out of things to say. Oh, Melbourne, cool. That's near where I live. I live about uh, 90 minutes from Melbourne, which is our version of Nia, because everybody's so far apart. I remember, God, this came, This is like another wiki story. Like, um, I live in the same state as Lance McDonald, and he had some Bloodborne stuff that Neff wanted to be scanned for the wiki. And I was saying to her, like, oh yeah, I live in the same state as Lance. And she's like, do you reckon we could get it off him? And, um... <laughs> it then became apparent that our concept of what constitutes a state varies wildly. Because my state is the size of her entire country. And she assumed that it would just be, like, <laughs> like a 15-minute bus ride or something. And it, it took 11 hours. It was on a train like, the whole day, <laughs> messaging people every time I got somewhere with reception. But we got it. We got the press kit. Okay, so... Yeah, and I might say very rare dialogue, which I, I will talk about. Uh... Oh, you need to have the stupid thing open, don't you? Uh... Yanomites have very, very rare dialogue. That is, it's tied to a specific animation. Someone brought up the trolls saying sister earlier, and I think it might be the same story for them. Basically, the Yanomites with the torches, they have this animation where they they go like this. Um, it's not an attack, it's like a defensive thing where they're trying to stop you from touching them. And when they do that specific animation, they say lines they don't otherwise say. That's where, like, lines like, um, death to the minister comes from. Because people say, I was, I was in Bloodborne, and they said, death to the minister, what triggers that? And we were like, is it what you're wearing? Um, is it, like, something you've done in the game? And the answer is, it's literally just that animation. Because that animation... For some reason, I think it's, like... I'm assuming that just there's like a table with the dialogue and the pointer is off for that one animation so it points at the wrong part of the table and plays all dialogue. But it's a lot more interesting than um, than just saying death to the minister because they have they have two lines which are um, Idola will be the judge and this is the judgment of Luvan and obviously Idola and Luvan they're not in the game. Who were they? And there's a, another cut one that doesn't play, but it was recorded, because it's still like, if you look in the files, it's there. Where they say, um, Aragon's Justice. Like, Ar Aragon's Justice. And, yeah, there's like, so like, L L Levan, Idola, and Aragon apparently were, I guess, healing church characters or something at some point in development, and they just, they never made it beyond that line. Okay, here we go. I apologize for this. 
because I'm just going to make sure I can get into the cathedral ward to quilt Eileen. But I want to have to redo this if it's wrong. Yeah, Australia's like, Australia is um, basically like, it's the size of North America, but it has the population, like half the population of California, to give a rough idea of how spread out everything is. So, like, I live in a, in a state that has six million people in it, but five million of them live in one city. So it's just like Melbourne and then a bunch of other cities that are like satellites, and I'm in one of those. So the place I'm in, it's like a hundred thousand people, but Melbourne is like five million. North America is technically larger, but like it's about the same size. Like that's the best way of explaining it. Is it's like if you imagine that. North America was just half the population of California spread out across that space. That's kind of what Australia's density is like. Yes, he's not there, okay. So I think this will do it. Melbourne is massive. Like, I remember um, Alison, my partner, who's from, from the US, like, she was convinced I lived in a desert. And then I showed her Melbourne and she's like, are you shitty? Is this real? Is this like a screenshot from something? Are you trolling me? I'm like, no, this is what it looks like. So this looks like, this looks like it's cyberpunk. This is like the future. Oh yeah, speaking of Canada, like, I remember I was, this was actually in an episode, I don't know which one it was, but like, Sin and I were talking about where we live, and she again was convinced I lived in this, like, backwards desert area. And she was talking about Melbourne, and it turned out Melbourne had more people living in it than Montreal. And she didn't believe me. And then when it turned out that was a true, she got genuinely like, oh, what? No! Okay, so we've got Eileen talking to us, so now we finally get to go. I'm actually planning to go to the US at some point to meet uh, Allison's family, so that'll be interesting. I've never been before. I mean, like, my first trip to the US, it's like, where did you go? It's like, I, I went to Ohio. Fine. Gotta start somewhere. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't want to complain about Ohio. Even people from Ohio are like, there's nothing here. But, you know, it's not like, not like where I live is particularly fascinating. Yeah, I know there's like some, there's some Lovecraft thing... Burkrug 
it's some like old like dinosaur deity that that he associates with Australia. Or Borkrug? Also, if eagle-eyed viewers may be like, oh, wh why is there an item missing? Because there should be a frenzied cold blood on that, um, that corpse, and the reason is that what I did was, when I created this character, because I was on um, version 1.0, that had a working dupe glitch. So I went and I grabbed that piece of cold blood. And I duped it, like, hundreds and hundreds of times, and that's why I'm on level 200. That's all the echoes from that cold blood. Nemesis. The cannon that can still one-shot us at level 200. Boom. Oh, one of my friends are from Ohio. I feel like I'm, I'm defending myself like I'm actually a lot of my friends are from Ohio. I can't possibly be prejudiced against it. This is interesting that, like, the first place you go, it's like, oh, where did you go? I went to Los Angeles, I went to New York, went to Hawaii, and it's like, where did you go? I went to Ohio. I'm just doing this in case we die. It's like not likely, but happen. See, once we're done with this, uh, we'll, it's like oh, okay. So it's like it's quarter to one in the morning here. So I reckon we'll be done by like one-ish. So then after that, um. I'll just show off a little bit more of the wiki, which is the reason that we're doing this stream. That's why there's a donation link at the bottom. I cut this has just become a stream about Ohio. Yeah, I'll, I'll, shout, I'll shout out to all the Ohio peeps. Um, obviously Allison, uh, my beloved is from Ohio. Our friend Mark, who sometimes shows up in chat as the 3-2, uh, he is from Ohio. Awol, who's like a, um, Elden Ring, uh, war hunter who I'm friends with, she's from Ohio. And our other friend Piku, who is also friends with Mark, she's from Ohio. This is actually remarkably similar to the climate where I live, this sort of area here. This is a very misty, kind of humid, swampy place. I've told this story before, but like when um, Old Hunters launched, it was summer here, because we're in the southern hemisphere. So Old Hunters came out and it was really hot and sticky. And then when I got to the fishing hamlet, I was just like, oh, that looks so nice. I kind of just be cold and crisp again. Anyway, here we go. So hopefully the final time we have to see the shadows of Yana on stream. Ah, uh, I'm just...
That, um, the reason I'm worried potentially about dying here is basically we haven't seen it yet because I've killed them so quickly, but if they get to the snake phase, the snake still can, like, one-shot you if they can connect. It's very, very smart. Okay, speaking of like places where Yaha Gol is, um, I remember when I was on the way to Sea Lance, I showed Sim like a map of all the places we we're going through, and one of them's called Warrigal, and she's like, Warrigal, unseen village. I can hear cats fighting outside right now. They're spitting at each other. Ingrid Ingrid is 17 years old. And her back legs don't work properly. But then her nemesis is also like a 17, 18 year old cat. That's also like completely non-agile. So basically they run into each other and they just sit there going, oh but not actually doing anything. Well, Shadows of Yarn, I'm like... People might know this because I know a lot of people that follow us follow, like, Lance and the data mining and stuff. But, um, Shadows of Yarn, um, Originally, that was that was the snake. Like the um, the the snake that they summon out of the ground. That was the boss. Hello, oh, Ingrid. Taking she's okay. Um, might actually just kill myself. Oh, okay. I thought that would kill me. Alright, so we're fighting Rom. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll just fight Rom. I don't know, I, do I have enough? Is 12 enough? Because Rom is so random, it's hard to tell. If anyone, like, remembers when Altair and I did this the other day, um, it was very much the opposite of this. Like, I just showed up with a Beast Cutter, not the Beast, the, the Whirly Gig Saw and Beast Blood. And I just propped the Beast Blood and held L2 and Rom died and, like, was just, like, watching the health bar just melt. Unfortunately, we can't do that this time, so I can't be bothered running to the DLC and having it. It also involves killing an alien. If you time it right, you can actually, um, you can stagger Rom out of her teleport and she just stays there. But I don't know enough about the mechanics to do it consistently.
Where I Live um, actually doubled for New England in, in a couple of films. It's actually, it's, it's um, recently doubled for Boston. Because apparently, it, it, there's like a his I don't know if it's out yet, but there's like a historical drama about the Boston Marathon. And apparently where I live looks more like Boston did when the marathon started than Boston does now. So there are all these like film crews in the main street, like setting everything up to look a little bit more Bostonian so they could film that. We've also had a, um, there's a version of Salem's Lot starring Rob Lowe. And that was filmed here. See, it, it sort of looks, apparently it looks more like New England than a lot of New England does, like people's idea of it. It's like this, like, old colonial place. So, hopefully... We just run back. Why am I doing this? I can just walk. I have to make sure we don't get grabbed because it can it can soft lock you sometimes. Not not we should be fine now, but basically an example of a soft lock would be like if you warped here and then you um you got locked out, you have to go and beat gas coin, but if you beat gas coin it would reset the time to the afternoon and you couldn't open that door again, so you'd just never be able to progress. So you want to always make sure you can grab this lantern. Uh, another example would be if you did do that, and then you ended up back here, and it was it was a afternoon, you'd have no way of leaving. Like you wouldn't be able to make progress because the the elevators wouldn't activate, and there'd be no boss. So now. Also, if people don't know, um, there's an anime, I've forgotten the name of it, it's like an isekai, and the, the, there's an episode where they go to, like, the capital city of the fictional world, and it's literally the, the Melbourne train station that I used to live across the road from. They call it the capital of the Midgard Empire, and there's this massive train station, but it's just referenced, like, <laughs> entirely from, from Flinders Street Station in Melbourne. Which I actually used to live near when I was a student. I lived in a student student flat that was like over, over the road from it. Should we bring Henry out again? Mm. I think yeah. Let, no, let's let's just uh, go by ourselves. So if this works. So I'm hoping this worked. If it did, we should get Eileen and Amelia in the fight together. You might I think they overlap when you're here, so. Let me. Oh no, yeah, you can see her. Okay, I don't know if you can see her in the stream, but you can definitely make out like Amelia is not Amelia. Eileen is standing. I wonder if she'll show up in the cutscene. This will be interesting. Do we see her in the cutscene? No, that's a shame. So people who don't know, um, Amelia is a bell maiden. That's why she's got her face covered. Because if they moved her face, if you could see her face, she'd have like the decayed zombie face. They just give her this like flesh texture. It kind of works on the hands. But she has, she has like the decayed monster face under that, so that's why you never see her. And this is all done um, by just like merging the two models together out of shot and having light go through it to create this like um, the shadow changing. But there's no um, there's no like actual transformation animation. It's just they just like shadow puppets. Like they hold them out of camera and make them move around. Okay, here we go. There we go. 
We've got Eileen and Now they can hurt each other. Yeah, you can see she's Eileen's actually taking health off Amelia as she like shoots her. Because then they they don't target each other, but they can still feel like Amelia's hurting Eileen. They don't do very much damage, but. She just she just staggered in the air. much the same amount. I wonder who went. Oh my god! Did she kill that? Oh, it's still coming. Ah, and Amelia's healing. Okay. <laughs> yep. Amelia killed Eileen. Just like how Ludwig killed Maria. Why is Eileen here? Eileen's here because of the time zone manipulation I did. So basically, you you trigger Eileen to go into that state, but you can do it without killing Amelia. So then when you head up here, Amelia shows up. Um, Eileen and Amelia both show up at the same time. We did it with the Bloody Crow, but obviously that was like borderline impossible. Anyway, that was it. That was uh, pretty much it. Actually, no, it's night time again, so like we can, I don't know. I think we showed off pretty much everything we could at night time. We'll just go to Yaha Gold to finish up, to show it again so it looks nice. Oh yeah, for people who don't know, that, um... That is the, the window that you break through in Upper Cathedral Ward. To get to Abriatus. And the reason the Cleric Beast has that jumping animation is that he was going to jump out of that window originally, like you would. We can actually show it off when I'm done. Basically, you'd come here, the skull would be there. You'd reach out to touch it, and then from behind you, the Cleric Beast would jump through the window, smash through the glass, and go thunk in the middle. And then the... Poor person. Um, they would land behind you. And you, you didn't fight them that way. And they recycle that into the, um, it jumping from, from the, behind the bridge. Anyway, um, that's it. We'll go to Yaha Gold just to finish up, because Yaha Gold looks really pretty at night, and you don't get to see it. So we'll just show it off one more time, because it looks really, really nice. And then, um, we'll finish up, because it's just on 1am for me now, so... We won't be able to get to the second half. I'll, I'll show you how that works. Actually, I'll show you what we can do um, if we don't light one Reborn's Lantern. We're back in nighttime, Yahagol. I'm um, just in case anyone didn't see this earlier, like I'll just show off how wonderful like the lighting here is it's really atmospheric it looks amazing 
and you never get to see this because of the way that the the time works this whole like sort of beautiful like misty moonlit yaha goal it only get here through glitching so i'll just show you um how this works so we have sort of no means to like interact with a lot of yaha goal i think the door's still open yeah, the door's still open. Yeah, the, okay, these are the statues. Oh, we'll, we'll go past a bunch later. There's statues here that look a lot like the worm faces from, from Elden Ring, which led to this whole thing about, like, were the worm faces recycled or unused Bloodborne enemies? And it's... It's kind of like... Like, you can see it's the same position where they're, like, praying like this, and some of them have the shrouds that the worm faces have, but these are, like... Is this a... Just show off parts of your hub we didn't see earlier. So these doors open, but I think some other ones won't. And the, the point is the elevators don't work in this state. And the interesting thing about Yahagul is like there's this whole thing there, you go through the wall, you open it up, there's like a shortcut, takes you out the side, blah blah blah. Um, it's like pretty standard Souls level design, but then we just like rewind for a second, we can just do this. And we've skipped all of it. It's it's like they've built this whole like Souls level progression thing into it and you don't use it. This is just there's just a railing that you walk through. And I know it's like kind of secret, but that's what we mean about, like, the worm face, like, that animation. Where it's, like, this big thing with these massive, like, hanging tentacles, and it's, like, going... The giant lampshades, I think, are actually lanterns. Like, less like, lamps. Um... Also, see, like, there's no amygdala. Because it's the wrong time of day, so... And, like, that's interesting to me, because I would assume that, like, since you're not supposed to be here, you would have amygdala, but you don't. If we go in here, the yeah, there's like the treasure chest there. That's where the cathedral ward key is. The thing about Yaha Gol is like there's mirrors everywhere, and like it's sort of clear that the mirrors are being used to reflect the moonlight around the city. So like everything becomes bathed in the moon, and that's why like like there's corpses near the near the the um the mirrors that are frenzied. There's like stuff from the from the moon is like reflecting into the the mirror and reflecting onto them. But look at that! Yeah, there's like that beautiful moon. And it's weird because like you'd think like this sort of image here, you'd think like, oh yeah, this is what Bloodborne's like. It's not because the moon the moon is largely like it doesn't play a part in Yarnum until it goes red because the whole of the night you're pretty much in the woods. You don't really. You have to make a point of coming back, and a lot of the city's locked off when you do. Yeah, we can sort of explore here where there's no... There's no amygdala, there's none of the, the Hemwick women are praying. Yeah, I think, yeah, you could actually see this from the jail, so you're right. Like, there's a reason for them not to not be here. But also, this is a different map, is the thing. Like... Like, if we look down, like, that's where the main street is, but you can see that, like, it's not literally the main street, it's like a distance model. So you'd think it's, yeah, they, I don't know. Like, like mist on the ground. And... That's what that building looks like when there's not a giant spider on it, if anyone was curious. Yeah, and you can see, like, because it's a different time of day, the Snatcher is there. We don't get the, um, the, um, the three hunters like we, we normally would. Oh, look at that. That's amazing. That's, like, a really nice, actually, when you think about it, that's a really good position, because it's someone who's literally, like, meditating, staring at the moon. That's great. Why, why is this not in the game? Why do I have to glitch to see this? It's so bright as well. 
Look, I'm not an expert on the skyboxes, but I'm fairly sure it never gets that bright normally. This might actually be like an unused lighting setting. I don't know. But yeah, like, it's so, like... And, like, it being so empty... Yeah, eerie. Like, the way that it, it's, like, so empty and just, like, quiet. And it's this, like, moon that's, like, bathing everything in this really bright light and there's mist everywhere. It, it's incredible. Also, this is, this is also, like, an area that you... You just run through normally because there's this summoning the the blood spectre things. You often don't really get to appreciate this space because it's like Yahago. When you go back, it's like so chaotic that you just run through it. But this is like it's really pretty. That's interesting. I don't think we ever go there. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's like an, an out of bounds area. But there's all these like doors and things. I brought this up before, but a lot of the distance, the what the buildings seem the distance here. They're actually just two D images of buildings that they kind of stack to bulk out the skyline. They're not actually three D objects. But it works really well. Like everything about this is like the art direction is so good. It doesn't matter that. Sometimes the lighting's a little off and they take shortcuts and stuff. Who's that? Oh yeah, this is this is the bridge you go under and that's like that leads you back into the jail. But then that area there I'm pretty sure you never go to. Now we can go back in here, but this will just lead us back to like Yeah. So this is just leading us back into like the normal Yahagol. So from this point on would it seem to be the same as before? I can't fit through the door. Um, oh, here's the one. Here's the one. This is like what we mean about the worm face. Oh, actually, there's a really nice worm face one in the um, in the main street. Nothing should really pose a problem. Yeah, it's like yes, yeah, Jane's saying like this is like someone's remembered Bloodborne from like rather than accurately recreating it, and it is exactly like that. Like, this is the stuff you remember Bloodborne being like, but isn't actually in the game. I've also noticed a lot of Bloodborne fan art involves parkour, which you do not do. But it feels like you should be doing parkour. I just want to show off the statue of my life before. That's the one. That's the statue where we're like, Hey, Maps here! Hey! Hi! We're almost done, I'm sorry you missed like 90% of it. Um, that's the statue that looks like Wormface. The way it has the like, the, the sort of tattered cowl across its face. Like that's... We're pretty sure, like... It may not necessarily have been like a Bloodborne enemy, it might just be like a piece of concept art for an enemy that they reused, but like, they look way too close together for a big concept. Really given that they look nothing like anything else in Elden Ring. Why am I bothering? This is a cleaning house at this point. That's here, hey. Oh, thank you for being here. So yeah, um... I don't know if you saw, but we were, we were showing off Yahoo all at different times of day. We can still go back there, because the door will stay open. My controller is being a pain in the ass. It's disconnecting itself. There we go. We were just showing off, um... The nighttime Yahoo lighting. I was thinking, like, if they ever did something with Bloodborne, um, the sneaking and the jumping from Elden Ring and Sekiro, like, I think they would really, really 
really have been an asset to this. Like if they ever did like not a Bloodborne 2, but like a, a similar sort of game. Um, having that extra movement and like the focus on stealth, it just it really fits with like the vibe this place has going. Let's go on one more time. Yeah, this, st this stealth is like, you can... Oh, okay, the, the part that always makes me think of stealth, actually, I'm not going to show it off because I've been through this game three times already tonight, but, like, the part that always makes me think of stealth is in that little lower section of Old Yarnum, um, not Old Yarnum, in Cathedral Ward, after you go down from the Hunter's Workshop and there's, like, a bunch of little narrow streets, there's specifically a part that's set up where, like, if you go down an alley and you're not paying attention, you'll knock over a bunch of bottles, and the bottles make a noise. And it's like, that's so close to being like, is this alerting enemies to my presence or something like that? Like, you have to be careful where you're going, but it doesn't do anything with that as a concept. And I don't know, maybe maybe some of they ended up in Sekiro, because that's way more stealth-based. Yeah, that's the, um, that's the bulked-out skyline that's mostly, like, flat images. Anyway. I think that's it. I think we've seen basically everything we can see uh, through doing that. So I might call this a day. This will stay up if anyone wants to see. Oh, hey, Barbarian. Yeah, though, a lot of people are showing up just as we're ending. We've been going for over three hours now. So um, this will stay up. So if anyone's curious about, like, you know, walking around with the time zones, seeing, like, like, we just had Amelia and Eileen fight each other. We've had the Bloody Crow and Amelia in the same room. Uh, we've had Yahagol at different times of day. I think that's pretty much all you can do. We've had Gascoin at different times of day. Um, I think that's really all we wanted to show off. So I think uh, this is probably... Probably it for tonight. Um... I think, like, before we go, um, just because the purpose of, like, doing these streams now is just to raise a bit of awareness for, like, ways you can support the Bloodborne wiki. So, someone brought up uh, the Cleric Beast cutscene, so I might actually show that off uh, now that we're done. So, let's just fix download our old file again. And we want to go download. Okay, so, uh, the screen may go weird for a second, because I'm just switching how my monitors work to be able to do the next part, so... My gaming monitor is all 